Hi, it's Jennifer from Shabby Fabrics. I have a Christmas project for you today that is so practical, so fun, and so easy to make. This is one of the very newest June Taylor Quilt As You Go project. This is for a tree skirt. And look how nice and big it is. I love that. Sometimes tree skirts out on the market today are just a little bit too small. You no sooner get them under the tree and they kind of almost disappear. I love that this is nice and big. It goes together quickly. Now this is made out of Cardinal Song. This is a Moda Christmas collection and we have limited kits available. We used, we did this with a jelly roll. They did, June Taylor, June, and let me show you, June Taylor did their original one. This is what the kit actually looks like, the batting kit. And they just did strips of fabric. So you don't have to do the strip piecing. We thought it'd be fun and we love new ways to use jelly rolls and pre-cuts. So we went ahead and did a strip piece method and I'll show you how to do that today. Otherwise, if you just want to be using maybe four to six different fabrics, you can follow the instructions included in the kit and you'll be able to make them with just a couple different fabrics and you'll be on your way. So while we're looking at the kit, you'll be getting this template. And notice how they did put these lines in here so that if you do want to do the two and a half inch strips, they've already put the lines in there, which of course are for your seams. They help you line up your strip set so that you can cut them precisely into the necessary wedges. We'll be making a total of 16 wedges to make our tree skirt. This is what the batting will look like. You've got your instruction sheet included, and we're following their instructions for the most part. We deviate just a little bit on the binding. We have some tips and techniques that I think you might uh, prefer or you know, follow what's included in the batting kit. So when you open this up initially, notice there's some wrinkles. Um, Right away in the instruction, June Taylor mentions don't iron your piece of batting. We typically are always ironing out wrinkles. Just know that they're concerned that if you do iron now, it could distort or shrink. And then all of a sudden, uh, things maybe aren't going to line up the way that they should. So don't worry, as you work through this, it will smooth out. Now, one of the first steps that we did with our batting, which of course is what everything will be sewn to, is we just cut an inch around and we got rid of some of the bulk out here. And you'll need to choose your backing fabric. The collection that we'll be using today is actually called Swell Christmas. I can't wait to show you what fabric is on the back of that particular um, tree skirt. It's so popular. This collection was actually came out Christmas last year, and this was so popular, maybe potentially Moda's most popular Christmas collection ever, that they've brought it back. So this will be the back of your tree skirt if you're purchasing the kit from Shabby Fabrics. So you will be putting that on with some basting spray. That'll also help you get that batting kind of smoothed out. So use whatever basting spray you're comfortable with. There's plenty out on the market. As I said, cut an inch around, discard this, or you could keep it maybe for extra projects. We went ahead, smoothed it out, sprayed the back of this, and then smoothed out our Swell Christmas backing. And let me just bring that out for you again so you can kind of see where we're gonna start. Everything starts with that. I'll move this one out of the way. So as you can see, you know, this is kind of that classic Christmas. It's got the darker colors, poinsettias. It's got gold metallic, beautiful, very classic. But now with the retro Christmas, it's just going to be cuter and more retro Christmas. So depending on how you like to decorate for Christmas, this tree skirt will really work beautifully in any Christmas collection. Now, if you want to, at this point, to minimize the bulk, you could just trim away that red fabric and just put it aside. For now, I'll just go ahead and leave that. And I wanna point out how the batting is pre-printed. I did not draw those lines on, it comes printed that way. And notice there's numbers. If you have not done any quilt as you go projects before, it's really kind of like, well, quilt as you go. You start with putting your first 
stripped down, and then your second, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about how are we going to go ahead and prepare our strips so that we can make the strip pieced um, tree skirt. So I mentioned that we like to use a jelly roll. We went ahead and made four strip sets that each have nine strips. So that's a total of 36. Most jelly rolls have 42. So you'll have some jelly roll strips left over. Uh, maybe there are some that you prefer more than others. Or, you know, if you prefer them all, you'll be able to set them aside for a different and maybe coordinating project. So we have, as I mentioned, four different strip sets all the way salvage to salvage. And we've sewn them just pressing all the seams in the same direction. So I highly recommend, um, rather than pressing your seams open, just go ahead and press them in the same direction. And as you'll see later, we're going to get some really nice interlocking seams which helps everything just to click together. Those seams are coming together beautifully and your tree skirt's gonna come out looking so beautiful. Um, inside your kit, you're also going to be getting this template like I mentioned to you before. Now the template can be just a little bit slippery. So we've got a couple things that would recommend that you do to kind of reduce the chance of that slipping away when you're cutting your strip. And that is this handy grabber it's a product that's fairly new to us, and what I love about it is it's very affordable. You can cut the strips, and they, you can, they just, they're on here forever. You get one template in your kit, and of course, you don't want to accidentally cut that, which, by the way, I did that. Be, and I'll show you right here. Let me just, true confessions of a quilter here. I did go ahead and cut that template by accident. I decided then to use another ruler on top of my template, to kind of protect my template so I didn't start whittling away at my template and maybe reducing the size of my shapes inadvertently because you do only get one of these in your kit. Um, so one of the reasons I like things like the handy grabber is I don't have to worry about the slipping away as I'm cutting. I don't want to miscut my fabric or maybe miscut or actually cut into my template. These are quite slippery. With the handy grabber on the back, they don't go anywhere. They're much sturdier. So let's go ahead and use that one and I'm also going to use in conjunction with it because, like I said, I did inadvertently cut that template when I wasn't using another ruler on top of it. I'll show you what I mean. So when I was placing my template on top of my strip set, and notice how our lines are lining up beautifully with our strips. And if those don't line up, sometimes it's just because maybe you didn't press completely. So it, notice how I just pull this ever so gently. I probably didn't press it quite all the way, all the way out. And there's my little oops cut. But to avoid that little oops cut, I recommend go ahead, once you have that template where you want it to be, put this on here. It's just more reinforcement that you're not going to inadvertently cut that template. Okay, and then we're just going to simply rotate that around. Let's cut that again. You can see how easy it is because the template is so clear. I actually did not even realize I was cutting into the template, but with this nice ruler having that very specific ridge, there's really no way for me to ride up on top of that with my rotary cutter. So it's a nice, um, it's just a nice little security blanket to have this more robust edge. Uh, consequently, with this particular ruler, let's say that you have a beautiful fabric stash, which I bet you already do, and maybe you want to use your own fabrics to make this. The beautiful part about using this ruler in conjunction with the template is you'll be able to cut your two and a half inch strips using this ruler. It is two and a half inches wide. So this is, has so many uses. If you haven't picked up this two and a half inch ruler, just do it right now. Black dots, again, are the fractions, one and a half, two and a half. White dots are whole numbers, one and two, and so on and so forth. So, so many uses for that um, particular ruler. Now, as you can see from my strip set, I'm gonna get several of these wedges, oh, consequently, 
the, let me mention one thing before I go on. The template doesn't go all the way to the top or the bottom of your strip set. At first that kind of confused me because I'm like, did I do something wrong? No. You just have to trim that off. I'm going to use probably a little smaller ruler for that, which I have, because it is a little bit awkward trying to maneuver this larger ruler left and right on my working space here. So I'm just going to go ahead and trim off that. I'm just following my template. Let's do that down here. And you could even do this step maybe in the end and do all of those together. Because again, you'll be making 16 of these. And you have so much fabric left over, you could almost make two of these, two tree skirts. Because you can see here, you know, I'm just going to keep here, and then you can just there. You, f you can just keep flipping it back and forth. You can see that you could probably get eight, nine out of here. You really only need four, maybe cut five, because out of each strip set, and remember you have four strip sets, then once you have those all um, cut out, you're going to want to lay that out. I'd recommend you definitely lay it out before you just start sewing it onto the batting, because the last thing you want is all of a sudden you get kind of all the way around and now it's not maybe the, the particular wedges that you want to be next to each other. I always like to lay out a project ahead of time and see what I'm going to get to make sure it's going to result in the look that I'm, I'm going for. So let's bring out some these wedges. And I wanted to mention to you that I would recommend you lay them out so that the strips have the seams alternating. So what I mean by that is, notice these have the seams going up. Well, I really want to have interlocking seams. So you notice how these have the seams going down? This is a, these are two that would be very good next to each other because these are going down, these are going up. We know what that means, right? We know that once we put these together on our batting, we're going to get some beautiful interlocking seams that's going to help us line everything up. So go ahead and let's see here. Yep, that's a great one there. So just lay everything out. Make sure you like it. Like, see how I don't, I don't like how there's two plaids right next to each other. I would pick something else to be there so that those two right, aren't right next to each other. Keep playing around with it. Lay that out. You can always cut more wedges. Remember, we have plenty of fabric that you can cut another one. If something isn't where you want it to be, you can also just alternate the direction that your seams are pressed. If, let's say, you know, I really want this one to be here, but the seams aren't going the proper direction, take it to your ironing board and just reverse the directions of those seams. So you get the idea. We're going to lay everything out, make sure we love it, and then we bring our batting out and let's get started on how do we put this onto the batting and get our tree skirt made. This is really about a half a day project, which I love that. It's, it's just, you know, I love projects that I can do on a rainy or snowy day, and I have something to show before the day is over. So let's bring our batting out, and we'll put this to the side. This does take up a lot of space. That's why maybe trimming some of that extra fabric is a good idea. Okay, let's find our number one. So with piece number one, let's look at that one. Piece number one, I think I'm gonna make this. Notice my footprint, okay? I want you to see these lines here. Make sure you can see that. This is your footprint right there. Ah, before I go on, once you spray basted your backing fabric to the back of your batting, a very important step. Notice how we're putting on these kind of wedges. A tree skirt's not shaped like that. A tree skirt's circular, right? Notice there is a, a kind of lighter colored dashed blue line. You want to use a contrasting thread. We use, in fact, blue to stitch on that line, and you're going to stitch just on the inside of that line. What that line is for is after all of these wedges are sewn on, 
we're going to be able to turn this over and we're going to see that line that we've sewn and we're going to cut out our tree skirt just on that line or maybe just to the right of that line. It's very important that you go ahead. I'm so glad I realized I forgot to mention that. You definitely want to go ahead and sew on that line so you know where to cut out your tree skirt. So let's, let's get back to where we were. We were laying out our first strip and it's going to fit beautifully in our little footprint. Now, this the nature of batting is this thing is just kind of very grabby. I don't feel the need to pin this down. If you feel the need to pin it down, do it. Do whatever makes you feel comfortable when you're sewing. All right, next strip. So these seams are going down. I definitely want my next strip to be going up. And I like this arrangement. I think it's really cute. So I'm just going to lay that on here. And now you can be sure that I'm going to pin because I want to have beautiful interlocking seams. That's when using my patchwork pins really, really comes into play. And I'm just going to turn it so that I can definitely see it and pin it the way I, I know I should be pinning it. So I can see, hopefully the overhead camera can see that. I'm going to go right down that seam, right down that seam, and I'm going to pop my pin right back up. I'm going to back up just a little bit here. That way I can leave my pins in place while I'm sewing. And you continue to pin all the way down at each intersection. There's a lot of fabric I'm going through between the, the two layers. And I'm actually pinning this to the batting. I could see how it would be easy to um, kind of pin the fabric just to itself. But I think just so that nothing moves in this process, I'm going to go ahead and pin it through the two layers into the batting so nothing is moving while we're taking this over to the sewing machine. Oh, come on, there we go. And then one more. I've got a red 50 weight cotton in there. I think I've got a 57D. I'm sewing on a Bernina 770. Thank you, Bernina. We love your sewing machines. All right, let's take this to our machine. Now notice how, notice how my seams are up right here. Sometimes when you're sewing and your presser foot comes in, it wants to roll that seam. I'll be using a purple thing today. This is one of the most affordable and useful tools you're ever going to have in your sewing room. It helps you lay that seam down and keeps your fingers out of the way and keeps you safe. So let's go have that handy just in case some of our seams want to roll on us. And let's head over to that sewing machine right now. It definitely takes a lot of space to make this tree skirt. But again, I think just trimming off a lot of this red, uh, obviously fabric you would love to use again on a coordinating project would help reduce a little bit of the footprint. So let's unpin. And I know our normal temptation, our normal habit after sewing a seam is to press. And again, June, June Taylor says, resist that. Please resist that. Don't do that at this point. Go ahead and flip that, and we have a roll and press. It's kind of when you know you need to press, you want to press, you need to establish the seam. It's a way to establish the seam without introducing heat. And I use this a lot. I'll tell you when I use it actually the most is at a quilt retreat. 
because there's so many limited irons and sometimes the iron is over across the room depending on you know we could be at an old cabin or a house that doesn't have outlets near my sewing a table f to that can handle uh, the amperage of an iron so having that that little uh, roll and press is wonderful for this purpose so you can see now we've done that you would have your layout and by the way maybe once you have your layout take a picture of it that way you can refer to that or maybe you can just stack your strips up you could potentially put a little number in the corner three four five six seven just to make it easier these are just ideas to help you so that you're not having to reacclimate to your project and you can kind of just keep sewing and keep sewing so let's let's say that this is our next strip let's double check that our seams are going to work actually those won't work so we need to get one that has seams going downward and these are going downward and let's take a look do we like how that looks if we like how that looks you're going to just repeat that process right sides together pinning your seams go to your uh, sewing machine sew your quarter inch seam allowance remove your pins trim your threads flip roll and press and you're going to continue all the way around until you finish with your 16th fan now i'll go ahead and go do that off camera when we come back that will be stitched down i'm going to probably go ahead and trim this uh, red santa fabric off just to reduce the footprint and we're going to show i'm going to show you how to take it to the next step how we're going to cut everything out and then we basically just finish up with our binding so I'll see you when i have that all put together hi i'm back and i have all of my panels sewn on and just a reminder that the first and the last panel will not be sewn together because that's where we will go ahead and make our cut now june taylor recommends in the pattern to go ahead and kind of pin around the perimeter and i think that's because they don't want something to kind of maybe roll back and get miscut so i i don't know if you can see it but i've put in a couple pins all around here but far enough away from the line that when i cut out the shape of the um tree skirt that I'm not cutting any pins and potentially dulling my scissors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually open up. This is different than what the pattern tells you. I can easily see the line here. I'm just going to open that up to start with and I'm going to cut from the front right down that line. I'm working with my Clover Bordeaux scissors. These are so fabulous. I use them very um, on specific projects where I'm cutting through a lot of material and I want a nice clean cut. I use them with wool. I use them with things like the June Taylor batting kits. Anything where there's multiple layers. Okay. Now, this is where you can see, hopefully the overhead camera can see where that stitch line is. This is, this is where the circle is, but the actual stitch line of where they want us to cut is here. I will go ahead and I'm just going to put a little pin in right here because I don't want that to roll back on me. I'm going to do the same thing here. If you don't have the magnetic pin patty with those Clover Patchwork pins, just get it. You're going to be so glad. I can't tell you the number of times I've spilled my pins and just having a magnetic pin caddy, you know, to just quickly pick them up is and in, in lines them up too, which is incredible has saved me so many times. All right, so I want to make sure, let me make sure that I'm all lined up where I want to be. Now I'm going to flip this over, okay? I'm sure everything is pinned down and I'm going to flip this over and I've got a couple things to cut. Of course, the center circle and you can see now that blue high contrasting thread that's my roadmap i'm going to cut right on that line and out here around my circumference i'm going to go ahead you can cut just inside that line you could cut just on that line it really doesn't matter and that's going to give us our shape that we will then put our binding on so i will get to cutting and once i'm done we'll go on to the next step
Okay, we are all done with that cutting. And we can remove our pins right now that we have all around. You know, in the very beginning when I was a young quilter, I didn't have any formal instruction and I really just didn't know about quality notions, um, quality fabric even. And it was a friend of mine who knew all about that that really showed me the difference between, you know, a sharper pin with a glass head versus a wider gauge pin with a plastic head. And especially when I accidentally touched them at times with my iron, that other one melted on my fabric. And in the early days before I understood the difference between inexpensive fabric and first grade quality fabric, the shrinkage and the body and the hand and all of those things, boy, they all just, they all make a difference. That's for sure. Okay, so I've got all of my pins out. So let's get this headed toward us. So now you're like, okay, how do I bind this thing? Well, as you may or may not already know, if you're an experienced quilter, I'm sure you already know this. In order to navigate around a circle, you want fabric to have stretch. And when fabric is on grain, either across the width of the fabric or especially down the length of the fabric, there's very little stretch to that fabric. But when you cut that fabric on the 45 degree angle called the bias, it has more stretch and is more readily able to go around and ease around, especially a tight corner like the inner portion of the tree skirt. So uh, it's indicated in your pattern, but I just want to emphasize, it's very important. You go ahead and cut those strips across that 45 degree angle because it's going to give you that stretch. See how it's already got that stretch in my hands? You can see that that would not be possible with fabric that is cut across the width of the fabric and especially down the length, which has even less stretch. So to get this started, I have made a long strip of binding. The pattern will designate how much, what length you need. And I just am pressing that in half and I have a blunt edge here. I'm going to start that along as you're facing your tree skirt, right along this edge and I'm gonna go right up to the edge. And we're gonna, we're gonna first come down here and we'll pivot at the corner. I wanna talk you through that. That may be a new concept to you, like how do I make that pivot at the corner? I'll show you how. It's very simple. And I'm gonna use the help of my Wonder Clips. I wanna get rid of using my pins right now because the project's gonna start getting close to me, especially as I've got binding and I'm coming toward myself and pivoting. I could potentially kind of jab myself with a pin. This is where the Wonder Clips come into play. Flat side that's clear is on the bottom. That'll be riding right along my sewing machine. The arc and the curvature will be on the top. The color's up on the top, clear is on the bottom. So just keep that in mind when you put those on so they're not put on upside down. So let's just clip and we'll clip as often as we feel that we need with the whole goal just being that the, that the strip stays where it's supposed to stay and doesn't walk off the edge here. So let's just look. I wanna first make sure that where my edge is, let's line that up really, really well here. That's important to me. That's gotta be lined up. And you know, if, if you need to, if your strip is just a little bit longer than your batting, just a touch longer, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and give a little bit of a trim here. Let's find that longer ruler. There we go. I need that batting to be running right, or that binding to be running right along. There we go. My fabric was just hanging over my batting just a touch and I could feel that my binding strip wasn't going to be wrapping around the actual binding, but more just the fabric. Okay, so anytime you run into something like that, stop, figure out what happened, fix it, and then let's go back. All right, let's reclip. We're going to clip as often as we need to. Sometimes when things go a little bit awry like that, you know, one of the reasons I keep the camera rolling is I want you to see this happens to me too. I am not an expert. I just have some experience. You might even have more experience than me, a good chance. And we all kind of deal with the same issues. 
So that's why I kind of like to keep the camera rolling so that you don't think by any means that I am perfect at this because I am far from that. And I want you to know how, you know, a suggestion of how to deal with certain things. I'm only going to clip that far because I want to show you how to deal with the corner. So we're going to go do a standard quarter inch seam allowance. It's going to be kind of a challenge, right? Because you've got all this big thing. So, you know, you'll kind of try to figure out the best way to kind of handle your project. You might want to kind of deal with it like this. So there's, there's less just to, to manage kind of flopping around your table. Um, kind of find your way, but let's head over to the sewing machine. And we're going to sew. And I think I will lay that down just to help anchor it. We're going to sew a quarter inch seam and we're going to stop about a quarter of an inch from that corner. If you're not comfortable eyeballing that quarter inch, just take a little ruler and a little friction pen and just mark it ahead of time, okay? Because you do want to make that stop because that's where we're going to do a little bit of a pivot. Okay, so I've marked that. All right, let's get started with a quarter inch seam allowance. And we're going to, at that point that I've marked, we're going to stop. So let's get started. I am going to do a little back stitch right there. Goodness knows we're going to use this tree skirt for many years to come. So we want everything to stay intact. Let's get our little box of Wonder Clips and we can be putting those away as we're removing them. Okay, I'm going to move that clip now so you can ex exactly see what's going to happen. And then I can. So I'm getting close to my point here. If you have a machine that has a needle down function, engage that because you really want to know that your needle is going to land either just before it or on that spot. Okay. I'm going to actually backstitch a stitch or two here because I'm going to make a pivot and I'm actually going to clip my threads right now. Now what happens? is I'm going to turn this to make a 90 degree turn. You see that? Then, it's a little bit awkward because I'm very far left. I'll fold this back on top of itself. And I'm going to start again about a quarter of an inch away. I'm just going to put a little clip in here. I just want to show you what this is going to look like. And I can see that's my stitch from before. And you see that little notch on my presser foot? I can see that's a beam there. I'm going to start about right here. And I'm going to back stitch again a couple stitches. And now I continue going. Now this is where you see how, see how this fabric will stretch. You see that stretch right there? Let me show it to you. That's what binding, that's what bias does for you. It's going to go ahead and stretch around. Now, normally I would go ahead and clip this, not attached to my machine, but since we're already kind of here, I'm just going to make this work with you so you can see that the beauty of kind of having a wonder clip is I can kind of scoot it underneath there. And I notice the arc is happening. So let's just keep going for a little while. And we're just going to have that little presser foot just arc right around there. And we're sewing on our binding. Okay, and of course, here comes more turn. We're gonna turn, 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 clip. Notice I'm clipping much closer together. That's because I want I've got to, I've got to, because I'm putting a lot of tension actually on the fabric to achieve the turn. I have to stretch the fabric in order to get this the, the bias. So notice they're much closer. And I would continue all the way around. So let's, I'll go ahead and end that real quick. 
And I just want to point out kind of what you do and kind of how you end this portion of the binding. So let's go back to the front and I'll show you that part. Okay, what I wanted to show you here, the reason I stopped sewing is normally I'm not clipping while I'm attached to my sewing machine. I would, you know, continue to stretch my fabric around, adding my wonder clips frequently, as often as you feel you need to. And you don't want to stretch it so tight that once it's off the sewing machine, the thing kind of relaxes and almost puckers. So there is a kind of a, a sweet spot only stretch the fabric as much as you need to. Um, it really does go around it quite easily. It's in this inner circle that's going to be a little bit more stretch and pull required. But obviously you're going to pin, excuse me, clip all the way around, do the same thing in the corner that we did here, and come up here and again, make a nice blunt cut and stop there. All right. What I want to show you, because I will go do that off camera, but what I want to show you first is now how do we, what do we do with this binding? Go ahead and roll it all the way to the back. By the way, this is different than what the pattern instructs you to do. The uh, kit from June Taylor recommends sewing the binding on the back and rolling it to the front, which is okay. You'll, that just means your stitches will appear now on the top of the project instead of the back. This is why we opted to go ahead and sew the binding to the front, rolling it to the back, and we will secure that by what's called stitching in the ditch. That's probably familiar to you if you're a quilter. If you're not uh, a quilter or haven't quilted that often, that might be a new term for you. I want to show you how that will actually work. You can always bind projects by hand. There's nothing wrong with that, but knowing that a Christmas tree skirt will hopefully be under your tree for many, many years to come. Sewing it down by machine may just make it a little bit sturdier. Um, so we're going to keep clipping. I want to show you how to clip the corner. How do we deal with that corner that we, we did that kind of interesting transition? So let's just look at that. So you just bring one side down like this and then the other side over, and it makes a nice, beautiful miter right in that corner. I've always thought that was such a cool finish. So see that little tuck back there? Just kind of fold that over, just like that. It's kind of a more tender place, so take a little bit of care, and I do put a clip right in that corner, just to hold that down. And you'll keep clipping. And the clip as long as you can until you run out of clips. And then you'll stitch in the ditch on clipping. And then when you need to clip again, you'll just stop and reclip the rest. Let's go take that to the sewing machine. If you have the Bernina, there is a specialty foot that you can buy. It's incredible. I don't even know the number of it. I used it uh, back at Bernina. And it kind of goes forward and separates the fabric making it beautiful to stitch in the ditch. But let's say you don't have that presser foot. I recommend not using the 57D that kind of has the bridge on the right side, kind of the fence. I just have kind of a more generic foot in there now. I changed that out to, it looks like a 20C. The whole goal is I'm just going to try to sneak those stitches right into that gap and make them, they'll appear of course on the back, but I kind of don't want those to be appearing on the front, especially on my white fabric, right? I don't want to have any of that showing. So what I will do is try to separate the fabric a little bit with my fingers. And sometimes I just pull the fabric apart just to touch. Notice I'm going really, really slow. If you're going to make an error, error on the side of the red binding, right? Not on the white fabric where it would show. And I'm just kind of trying to pull that fabric apart so when it relaxes, it'll hopefully cover up my stitches. Let me move that out of the way.
Oh, let's pull that back. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to pivot. So let's, let's do a little pivoting right there in that corner. And we continue on, just like we've been doing. If you get a little bit over on the red like I am, I kind of just fade over into that valley again. And I'll go ahead and cut my thread here, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we're going to finish the rest of it. So let's just take a quick look with the overhead camera, hopefully, or even a close inside camera. And you can see that even though I didn't completely get that down exactly in that little valley the whole time, I tried to bias my mistakes on the red and it looks beautiful. The stitching is on the back of the project where I want it to be. Now what we'll do is I will go off camera. I will continue clipping around, sewing the binding on, turning it to the back, stitching in the ditch, so that when I come back, that part will be on. This will be all here and secured up to this point. The center portion can be just a little bit um, less intuitive, and I want to show you how simple that really is. But I don't want you to ever walk away from a project because you think there's no way I could figure that out. It looks too complicated. That's why I'm here. I want to show you that these projects are absolutely within your ability. So when I come back, we'll have that done, and we'll talk about how to finish up the center portion. Okay, I'm back, and our, t our tree skirt now has our binding all the way around the perimeter. Now we just have the center to go and the ties. Our pattern has us cutting 54 inches in length for the purposes of that inner portion and our two ties. So with this, we are doing our binding a little, well, actually just like the patterns instructing where it's kind of a double fold bias tape. Um, you could go ahead and continue with the method I had here. However, I think this is going to work a little bit better. So go ahead, take your strip 54 inches long. They mentioned for the raw edges kind of tying a knot so it doesn't fray. I know that these tree skirts are going to be around and potentially wash. Things happen. It's just natural they're going to be washed and sometimes uh, you know, if it's just tied, it can fray. I like to just turn that edge in a quarter of an inch on both ends and press. And then you're just going to press toward the center. So I wanted to just show you that. First, you just kind of just start off with, let me, let me just show it to you. You get your strip, your raw strip of 54 inch length of binding. Again, of course, that's cut on the bias and joined. Fold that edge in, give a press, and you can start off with folding your strip just straight in half like you would any other binding. And then you can open that up and press toward the center. That's what they mean by a double fold bias tape. So whenever you read that, that's the simplest way to make that. And of course, there's a lot of pre-made bias tape on the market. You don't have to make your own. If you like to um, just buy that already pre-made and there's a color you like, just pick that up at the store. So I have that ready to go, and that's for my full 54 inch length. The first thing they recommend that we do is kind of establish the center of that, which is of course here as well as for our tree skirts. So I'm just going to quickly fold that and establish my center. Let me just clip that so I don't lose my center. And the reason we're doing that is so that our lengths, if we're going to start attaching, let's double check our center, 
we're going to start attaching our binding here. That way, when it comes around here and comes down and comes around there, it's the same length. So that was the whole idea behind that. So again, I think I'm just going to clip this real quick so that that's not coming undone while we're working with our double fold bias and getting it established. Okay, you don't want to get a twist, so you also want to check that. Okay, there's my center. So you're going to open that center portion up, and I'm just going to, see that little valley? I'm going to open this up fully and get that into the valley of my bias. Double fold bias tape, okay? And you'll work your way all the way around. You might want to just kind of open this up. It's really important that goes deeply into that valley. Now, if you just kind of move this around, this will have a, a straighter edge for you and it's a little bit easier to work with. So let's keep clipping. Again, open that all the way up. I really want you to see this. You don't want to go shallow, right? You could inadvertently thinking it's there. Well, it's not. It needs to be all the way in and even. Otherwise, if the bottom portion isn't as equally attached as the top, when you go to sew this on, you can miss the bottom uh, fabric. So sometimes people opt to sew this binding on by hand because they are concerned about potentially missing the back because, of course, that's blind. Um, one option that's really fun and would be really pretty is to do a decorative stitch, which is a much wider stitch. It could be a zigzag, maybe snowflakes, and maybe a contrasting thread, white or pink or green. And that way you're kind of grabbing more of the meat of the top of the bi bias tape, the project itself, and then you're making sure you're grabbing that backing. So those are just a couple options for you when you are doing um, sewing this down by machine because you, of course, don't want to miss that fabric in the back. And then you would just clip these together down here. Again, working your way around very carefully, opening it fully all the way up, getting all the way into that valley and clipping. Then I, I would start down here on this end and I am going to do a decorative stitch where we just come up here we just continue. When we get to the project, we're doing a nice decorative stitch. It's grabbing that. I'm making sure I'm getting the backing. And we continue all the way around, finishing down at the end of our other tie. So if you've ever wanted to make your very own Christmas tree skirt, Swell Christmas is just such a classic, wonderful collection from Moda. And as you can see, we have a lot of projects to coordinate with the stockings. We even have uh, napkins that are reversible, plaid on one side with Santa's, the table runner, a casserole carrier, carrier placemats, and I know we even have more projects in the works. So this has been a longer video. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I know this is a project that you would love to make and your family would enjoy for years to come. I'll see you next time.